Nub Phenomenon. From the Giza Plateau to the Saxahuman Fortress above Cusco in Peru, a worldwide phenomenon seems to be apparent from our ancient past, and our friends at the Ancient Alternative View have been investigating. Described by Phil as the World Nub Phenomenon, these marks in the most ancient monuments in our world are gripping the attention of current researchers who are investigating what they might be. Until now, we had not had any idea what they may be. We may be beginning to understand thanks to the uncovering and connections taking place by the research here on YouTube. To help bring this phenomenon to the attention of the subscribers of the Lost History Channel, we have agreed to play the findings here on our channel, so... Hello everybody, and welcome to the Lost History Channel. In this video, we will be taking a look at the Nub Phenomena, which I've been investigating on my own YouTube channel, The Ancient Alternative View. We do hope you will enjoy these findings. I've come to realize and agree with that this is a key phenomena. It's one of the most perplexing arguments of a knowledge lost and of a past advanced civilization that are not credited any further than a primitive acknowledgement. The worldwide nub phenomenon is the physical evidence that proves a worldwide engineering culture that spans the four corners of our world. Within my team's research, we have found that even the internal workings of the Great Pyramid have nubs, which can be seen in the portcullis chamber. Cataloging and marking them shows us that there were different variations to the phenomena. You can find singular ornate nub examples, and these can be seen in India at Tamil Nadu, along with many, many other examples all over India. The variations shown are identical to those we find in Peruvian examples. The mainstream view is that nubs would be for lifting. This is not the case as there are bedrock nubs and Yangshan quarry shows that if nubs were for lifting then a 16,000 ton megalithic stone would have required some serious technology to lift it. We have investigated whether the nubs are star aligned and could show directional markers for the engineer's travel. To understand the nubs you must understand the variations of them. Based on nubs prove that the nubs wouldn't be for lifting. Examples of this can be found at Sagasta in Greece at the bottom of the pillars. Also, the Menkure pyramid in Egypt would have been covered in them, as shown by the examples around the doorway, entrance, the block above the door as a times three nub configuration, which can also be found in Peruvian examples also. The Levi mausoleum in Turkey shows the bevel edge blocks with nubs, so a different variation but of the same nub technology. The mineralogy of specific nubs, which we are investigating now, could prove exactly what they were used for, i.e. whether power was ever transmitted through them, or whether stone softening or geopolymers were used in the process. The theories that I have explored are that the nubs were communication system for a specific set of engineers that worked together around the world using similar methods to create this system. This would mean that the engineers could communicate with each other and also there is a connection to the stars in certain instances. The sizes of the blocks in South America with the nubs are simply too heavy to lift. They have so with the research we have done and conclusively say in most cases they are not for lifting and variation in the nubs is key to understanding them. Along with Michael and the team I work from around the world, together we can decode the nubs and their variations to determine exactly what the specific set of engineers that use this technique were trying to communicate and history can be rewritten again because this proves a worldwide engineering connection. Wait until you hear this. At first glance, the Coracancha wall seems as if there's nothing really to look at other than perfect stonework. However, one of the most enigmatic buildings in our ancient past has many, many secrets to offer. Now, uh, if we take a look at this photograph on the outside of the building, again, perfectly smoothed stonework, to the naked eye looking around, you probably wouldn't notice this solitary nub just staring and looking at us. 
So anyone that knew the nubs, anyone that manufactured or made them, would be in the know that this building contained such features. Now, the Coracancha, as I've said, is very enigmatic. And again, at first look from the outside, you'd think that this is just smooth stonework. Now, everywhere very, very smooth. However, just peeking at us here on this photograph is a section that has four nubs. Now, this is rebuilt because we can see that there's mortar in between the bricks. However, this is very, very ancient. No signs of nubs anywhere other than here. Now let's have a little bit of a look at those in detail. So again, anyone in the know that came to the Corricancha in ancient times would have seen these and probably just wondered, what on earth are they? But the rest of the building doesn't show them. I wonder why, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternate view. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, as we go to the inside of the building, this has to be, well, if you look at these nubs, and these are nubs, these nubs have angles on them, so they were definitely part of the manufacture. Now, the different sizes and the technical aspects of these nubs, notice as well, no polygonal stonework, straight, straight, straight straight they're proving to us here that they didn't need to in this structure do any sort of polygon or stonework just bear that in mind but these are some of the most technical nubs i've ever found in my searches and what i'm going to propose to you today ladies and gentlemen of the ancient alternative view is a theory that's never been proposed before i think that these nubs are part of an ancient stone language and these are part of the internal coracancha where the nub engineers could have seen, like a wall chart, this language. And we're going to have a look around the world, ladies and gentlemen, to see if I can prove it. Now, if we have a look on this wall here, it's not the greatest of photos, but you'll see my point. It looks on this side like there's no nubs at all, none, perfectly smooth stonework, apart from maybe here. Now, let's just get rid of that. You can see these are actually positioned at different parts of the blocks. They're different sizes, different depths, one over here to the left, one over here to the right, far left, far right. Now, if you can imagine this, as if the nub engineers walked past, had a look at it, and it was like a storyboard, almost like maybe a binary code or a braille pattern or something along them lines. I mean, the mystery does very much deepen ladies and gentlemen of the ancient alternative view. Now this is an excellent photograph. If we take a look at the nubs on here, you can actually see there's different varieties of nubs. Now the consensus on European nubs, bear in mind they're all around the world, we'll have a look at the Athens Acropolis later on, and they are similarly formed like this, with a circular top but they vary considerably from site to site. See one here to the left, one to the right, pitted middle here, nub to the right, one further in, two here, so a times one, a times one, one to the left, two one here. Could that be something that's speaking to the engineers of this Coracancha building? I believe it is, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view. Now, I wanted to show you this, just because nubs are so different from site to site. These cannot be for lifting, guys. The blocks are too small and the nubs are too technical. So I'm just saying that as these are internal to the Coracancha, couldn't these be part of an ancient stone language that we've lost? Just a question. Another example of just how perfectly these were formed. Now, again, this is inside a structure, inside the Coracancha. Look, no nubs internally at all, apart from one here, slightly over to the right, and one here, slightly over to the left. Now, could that have been telling the engineers something? 
Now, what I said before with regards that they didn't need to do polygonal stonework, just look at this example. Everything is very, very straight, as if the nubs are on lines. Now, two to the edges, two to the edges, one there. They're very, 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 very much apparent on here, but not on every block. Now, why? The only way that I can describe, now obviously this is newer here, more, but this is the ancient stuff. So this is where the nubs to me are jumping out and saying, this has to be part of something bigger than just a byproduct made from a block making process, ladies and gentlemen. So this is the photo of all photos to those that study the phenomenon bevel blocks and the phenomenon of nubs. Bear in mind, this is the Coricantia in South America. Notice the uniform style nub. This here has been dipped as if the line has been changed. So if this was a language, then you have to look at that they change the line of the language by coming upward or downward, like they have there. Now, why is this the photo of all photographs? Well, the bevel block conundrum seems to all be in the Mediterranean. Examples in Turkey, like Belvi Mausoleum, that we'll look at later, have beveled edges with nubs in the middle of the blocks. This is a fine bevel edge, ladies and gentlemen. One of the first bevel edge blocks ever found in South America. Now, this proves that the same engineering skill wasn't just in South America or just over in Europe or around the Mediterranean. No, no, it was worldwide. So the nub and bevel block engineers were worldwide. There's your proof there. Let's have a look at the configuration again. A two, a one, a one, but slightly further across up the line and so on. I think you're starting to get where I'm going here and wait until you see what I've found next. Now, I'm sure you've all seen quite a few of these images that I'm going to show you next, but when we're looking at it in a different way, what I want to show you is the way that their nubs were produced. Now, there's three here, two here, two here, two very small ones here, with what looks to me like three nubs there. Now, bear that in mind and keep it in your mind for a little bit later on in the episode. But if you imagine these as lines going upward and downward, these lines could change what these nubs mean, couldn't they? Just for argument's sake at the moment, but that's just one of the photos, bear with me. Now, this has already obviously been seen, it's the El Puma at Cusco. But if we sort of forget that for a moment and look at the configuration of the nubs that are around it, I personally think that everything was done with signs of the zodiac, so I think more scorpion, but there we go. But anyway, let's have a look at these. These are what are called inverted nubs. Now, I made up that term because there's nobody that actually had a term for them, but on blocks that we find that have got no nubs, they're actually inverted. Now, if you could look at this the same way as we have done before, like these are lines, and this is like times two, times one, not quite sure what's going on there, but like maybe two inverted nubs here, an inverted nub there maybe. You get the picture here and along this line again, two inverted nubs. Now, if this was some kind of encoded language, some kind of writing that only the nub engineers knew, then they could go up to these, know exactly what they were looking at, what was going on in the area. Anyway, let's go to some more examples, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I love this because it's a very, very detailed image. Apologies for some of the images if they're not coming out very clearly your end, but they're the best of the best of what I could find. So anyway, do you see these, again, different nubs? They're not the rounded ones that you found at the Karakantia, no. And what's that? It's not even a nub. So these are inverted nubs, see what I mean? Not knocked off because you'd see a completely different effect one nub there. Why not on all of these? Why not on all of them? Why on just a sporadic few of them? But anyway. If we take a look at the configuration of these nubs, 
These are massive blocks, by the way. And look how different they actually are. Now, if this was on a line and this was a language and these were going up on a line like this and only the nub engineers knew what they meant. Again, remember that these are thousands and thousands of years old and would have been more refined. So the language on these sites could have been a lot more clear back in our ancient past. Bear with me. Now, again, here, these lines. See how the polygonal stonework changes to accommodate where the actual nubs are? Now, in my eyes, that's lines, and it's set almost like we were doing musical notes. I'm not saying they're tunes by any respect, but I do believe that there was some sort of communication for our ancients, and we're going to have a look. If you imagine, look at these nubs here, how different that they are. It's in the middle of a doorway, almost saying this is the middle of the doorway, this is the main way through the entrance. Now, again... If I bring you to the side view here, what would be the point in having these ones down here? There wouldn't be any. These blocks are so big if they were lifting bosses that they would break. They'd just simply snap off their, you know, hundreds of tons. So for me, more, this is a front view of what people would have seen with regards to the language. If you want to have a closer look, then there you go. These nubs side on it. I know it's distorted a little bit, but they're very different from each other. So maybe the indentations, the inverted, where they're placed on the block, where they're placed on the line, could have been very, very important to the letter or wording or number that they were trying to get to. Now, what I meant by inverted nubs is where the nub itself has actually gone into itself. I mean, there's different theories to that and how it could have happened, but these are massive, they're really pointy. It's like you or I could step on them as these are very, very shallow. So could this wall have meant something completely different? Just a theory that I'm going to keep on rolling with because I'm passionate that this is true. Now, look, we've looked at this wall, but I've added some marks onto here. If you look at how the lines are set, how the nubs are set, how far apart they are, why would you have one on that little block? You wouldn't if it was a lifting boss, for argument's sake. Now, more inverted nubs, look more inverted what if each of these nubs meant something different each of these blocks for argument's sake we'll come back to this picture now again here why aren't the nubs on this front part here because originally this bit would have been inside i'm going to show you a separate image now in a moment look all the way down there very few nubs at all, if any. Now, if you would have wanted to put them up and cover all of this so no one could see your specific language inside, well, they did a pretty good job. I know the stones aren't there now because you can see the cruder stones that have been put there by the later Incas. And you look at the megalithic stones here where obviously they were capable of doing the nubs because they're there, but they're not on the front of the building. Maybe they didn't want to advertise themselves. Now, again, imagine this was a corridor that we were walking down. And we were walking down this corridor. Look at how refined some of the nubs are. We've got a couple here on the bottom course, which discludes them being for lifting. So if we imagine these being a line and these two set in the middle here, and may, the major bulk is over here to the left and we were walking down the corridor, maybe it was simple instructions to what went on down the corridor. I'm not quite sure exactly what each one meant yet, but I am positive that they are a language. Now, why am I showing you this? Almost like a picture board. Now, do you see here, we've got a better picture coming up, so don't worry. These are all nubs, internal nubs. And likewise, these were nubs. So let me just take you to this next photo here, which is very, very clear. I'm going to ask you a question. If you guys have been following me at all, then you'll know that I did an episode on Yang Shan, and you'll all be aware that Yang Shan is in China. And one of the megaliths there has an enormous lifting nub on there, maybe five or six on one of the megaliths. Isn't that eerily similar to those? But where would you have been lifting that to? Likewise, the Yang Shan megalith. Impossible. But here's some internal nubs here. Also on here, you have got the incised motif. It's very difficult to see. If I go back 
a photo. I think even though it's darker, I can show it you. Now, let me just zoom into here. Do you see it there? That's the incise motif. It can be found in Palmyra. Well, it could have been found in Palmyra. I do have photos of it. If you go onto my Pinterest, Philip Corbett, you can find many, many, many examples of the nubs all over the world. It's a bit of a where's wallet at finding some of them because some of them are singular to show that the nub engineers were there. These are showing you that something drastic was going on. They didn't have to produce these nubs. They could produce blocks as we've seen without them. But when you can deduce that they're proving that they're making the same blocks at the same places in South America as they were in China. Now, again, quite a small photograph, so I do apologise, ladies and gentlemen, but do you see how some of these blocks have nothing? They just left them completely empty. And to the corner here, there's a small one, very defined one here, a very defined one here, and then down the wall, obviously the more crude stone from later generations up there. It's almost as if on the inside of here they were leaving a message for us. So why in essence am I showing you this? No real nubs coming out other than these ones here and here, which are from a later date and repurposed, so we'll leave that for another episode. However, the megalithic part here, look at how some of these stones have been made. Now, over here you've got what looks like partial inverted nubs maybe, maybe a nub there, maybe one there, but it's these lines that fascinate me. Maybe the outside of here at some point was trying to tell us something, because if you bear with me, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view, JJ, uh, megalithic maiden, she made this discovery, and it's the same three-marked stone. Now, we're going to look in detail at this wall, ladies and gentlemen. Not maybe on this image as much, but lots. Notice these two nubs circular. If ever there was a language in our ancient world in nubs, look at the three above the door. The two, the one, the one, the two, the two, the two in the middle. But we're going to have a look at this in detail, ladies and gentlemen. Excellent find, JJ, well done. Now, in the heart of it, so-called Egyptian engineering, we find the nubs. Look at those, there's actually two on the other side as well. Now, these could have been functional when it comes to water coming in and out of here, bear that in mind. I've got a cracking link for that in a moment. But these are prominent defined nubs like we find all around the world. Now, maybe this said what the function was, how full it had to be, a level marker maybe. Now, if we have a look here on these stones, these are almost flattened, as if they've been flattened completely, like the entrance. And it looks as if they would have gone all the way up to me, all the way up over the top of the building. Now, the coup de grace, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to nubs and nub photos, this is it. Look at the opposing nubs here, guys. Two here, four here, and two opposing nubs there. None surrounding, maybe two opposing there. This is unbelievable. If this is a language and this went all the way up the pyramid, no wonder the casing stones were removed by later generations that didn't want the language deciphered. But why on earth would those have been put in that configuration, guys? They simply wouldn't unless they meant something. Now, what I'm going to do is zoom into this photograph here and show you just how easily they could smooth the entrance stones here. And if we look back a bit as well, look at this here. I mean, a couple of colleagues of mine have thought this may be an animal, huge nub coming out of the stone. Do you see the size of the little girl here? Look at the size of those nubs in comparison to her. If these are a byproduct of the making of the blocks, which I believe that they are, then these were done on purpose because there's none on these sets of two, two, two or one. What could have been two, two? 
the opposed nubs here, guys. The three, the two, the one. I mean, really, this is jumping out at me massively that it is a language. Now, let's have a little bit of a look and a zoom into two of the nubs. Now, these are rounded, just like what we saw. These are the massive nubs that the little girl was by. They're huge. Look at them. Now, these are part of the rock. They're actually part of the stone. You can see it here. You can see that this is part of the stone. They didn't have to do them. They could manufacture these blocks without them. The front of the Mencure pyramid shows us that. So I am 100% convinced that this was a language. Again, signs on these blocks of nubs. Two, a two, a one. We saw this in South America, this exact same effect. The bevel blocks were down there, which we can also find in Egypt, guys. This is physical evidence in stone that proves the nub engineers were up to something, whether it be my theory of an ancient forgotten language whether or not, or how they were made, whether they were a byproduct, this is proof these guys could produce them at will. And if they weren't something, why did they produce them? Now, this is another angle of probably the craziest set of alternate nubs I've seen. I've researched these and asked so many people why they are there. A two, a four, and an opposing two. If that is not a language, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view, I do not know what is. Now, bear in mind, this would have covered the Mencure pyramid. All these stones have been taken away or lost or whatever, but that was the case in stone. This language would have covered the case in stones. Well, the Mencure pyramid, ladies and gentlemen. More examples here. More examples of how the stones themselves have nubs on. Ones above do not. So they would if they were for lifting, just for argument's sake. But do you see how they're so different? They're so different and then smoothed. How did they do that unless it was heated? Were they just built as different blocks? Or were these meant to say something completely different? This is my favourite photo on the Egyptian Mancure Pyramid. It's almost like a storyboard of the nubs. This has to be a language. A two, a two, a three, a two may be inverted. One in the middle here. There's blocks with none on, ladies and gents. Blocks with ones on, blocks with none on. If these continued all the way up the pyramid, can you imagine what these nubs would have said? Now, bear in mind the weathering that's happened on the pyramids of Egypt. Bear in mind the thousands and thousands and thousands of years old these are. And how defined still these nubs are on the Mencure pyramid. Ladies and gentlemen, I propose to you that the nubs were a language written in stone. I propose to you that the nubs were a byproduct, but they were not a fluke. That these engineers knew exactly what they were doing. And that we are missing, ladies and gentlemen, a huge part of the puzzle by not looking into the nub phenomena more as an ancient language. The Athens Acropolis, ladies and gentlemen, probably one of the best sites in the world for nub architecture. Bear in mind that quite a lot of these blocks may have had nubs on. But we see a distinct pattern of just how defined some of these nubs are to then none at all. I know it's far-fetched sounding here. I know this isn't a braille board, but we communicate with that. What if engineers communicated the same kind of way visually back in the day? Look at how they're just set for no apparent reason every which way but loose. There's absolutely no way to me that these are not an ancient language. Now, this is the outside of the building. Now, there are none at first view. You wouldn't walk up to that and go, this is a nub engineering building, but if you look closely, 
those in the know would have known. They would have seen these nubs. They would have been attracted to these sort of places, especially if they were a very, very intelligent set of engineers passing on secrets. The Corricantia shows that they may have been trying to hide themselves. The fact that on the outsides of these buildings, very discreet nubs. Something to think about, ladies and gentlemen. Now, on the outside of the Acropolis here, which again would have been inside, this part here would have been built up and there's absolutely none at the bottom here, but different sorts of styles in nubs. Why are some of them shallow? Why are some of them more defined and refined than others? My answer is that this was an ancient language, ladies and gentlemen, that these people knew exactly what they were doing when they made the nubs. Now, here we go on the Acropolis. We've seen these in South America. Do you remember the rounded, almost triangular style nubs? These are in Athens. If these engineers did not come across each other, how are these nubs exactly the same? But I'd also like to bring you to if this was a language, you say they've got a block with two, a block with two, a block with one, four singulars, a two, a two, four, a two, a two. It just seems to me like it's a definite language. Now, one of my favorite pictures of nubs, my friend over at Ancient History Criticisms, Andrew, he supplied me with this. Thanks, Andrew. We're going to have a look at something on Andrew's work momentarily. But if you look closely at the bottom row here, there are nubs. There is no way those would have been lifted up onto there with them. They would have snapped. You're looking at two to 500 ton blocks at the bottom of here. Admittedly, these are quite uniform. However, if you look closely apologies for the loss of maybe some of the clarity here but some are more refined than others some don't have them some are up here that don't have them if they were for lifting that high wood surely they would be there this could be an ancient language staring us ladies and gentlemen right in the face now it's thanks to very good researchers like Andrew, Ancient History Criticisms, David, Uchronia, Utopia, Ziggy Dan, Shermanator, Bennett, Uncharted X, people that have taken fantastic photos of this phenomena that are allowing us to study not only the nubs, but the bevel blocks now as a worldwide engineering phenomenon, because that's what it is, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view. Now, is this a language? It's down to you to decide, ladies and gentlemen. Now, my friend over at Ancient History Criticisms, Andrew, he is one of the best nub independent researchers on the planet, and he's excellent at finding these. Now, he's probably got one of the major finds uh, in the ancient world on the nubs, and that was found in the Assyrian. Now, I'm just going to play this forward ever so slightly and just pause it here. Now, he's kindly give me access to his uh, videos for usage. Now, this in the Assyrian is a water level, and it would have actually been above the nubs, so only at certain points would we have ever seen these. Now, there's another channel, a good friend of mine, called L.A. Now, LAH, uh, over the last two episodes that they've released, bar their New Year's episode, um, have been doing a canal system in Kapsnipka. Now, these canal systems are really similar to the Assyrian in the respect that these nubs may well have been water level markers and could well have been underwater at specific points in time, but they're directly related. I mean, bear with this two seconds. Notice how they're on specific parts of specific blocks, one top left, one bottom right. Bear with me, ladies and gentlemen. I do have 
a close-up of a nub here coming up that I want you to see. Now, do you see this? These are some of the main researchers in the world on the physical evidence. Andrew at Ancient History Criticisms is one of the best nub finders in the world. We, as a team, along with all the other ancient researchers that I've mentioned, Dave Bubcat as well, if I haven't mentioned anyone, I do apologise. Michael over at Lost History, he's aware of this. Anyone that follows me on Twitter is aware that I put a lot of hours into the nub research. Now, these engineers were prominent, let's put that this way. These engineers were all over the world. Now, I'd like you to make your own decisions on um, what you think today about, well, I think some of the sites that we've looked at, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Bellevue Mausoleum, bevel edge blocks with the nubs in the middle, similar nubs at the bottom. They were in different positions, ladies and gentlemen. Look at this. I mean, you've got a two, a two, a two, and a one. I could go on all day about these at Bellevue Mausoleum. It's similar to the Mencure Pyramid in the fact that it all would have been cased in these stones. See the rounded that we've looked at today, the square protrusion. All could be different variables to a specific language that we are missing. And I propose that, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view, that the nub and the bevel blocks or its own language, to its own engineers, to its own special set of engineers that were all over our world. Although historical findings show that several ancient civilizations used elements of ciphers and codes in their writing, code experts say that these examples were meant to give the message a sense of importance and formality. The person writing the message intended for his or her audience to be able to read it. The Greeks were one of the first civilizations to use ciphers to communicate in secrecy. A Greek scholar named Polybius proposed a system for enciphering a message in which a cryptographer represented each letter with a pair of numbers ranging from 1 to 5 using a 5 by 5 square. The letters I and J shared a square. The Polybius square, sometimes called the checkerboard, looked like this. A cryptographer would write the letter B as one, two, as seen here, and the letter O as three, four, as you can see there. To encipher the phrase, however stuff works, the cryptographer would write this sequence of numbers because he replaces each letter with two numbers. It's difficult for someone unfamiliar with the code to determine what this message means. A cryptographer could make it even more difficult by mixing up the order of the letters instead of writing them alphabetically. Julius Caesar invented another early cipher, one that was very simple yet confounded his enemies. He created enciphered messages by shifting the order of the alphabet by a certain number of letters. For example, if you were to shift the English alphabet down three places, the letter D would represent the letter A, while the letter E would mean B, and so forth. You could visualise this code by writing the two alphabets on top of one another with a corresponding plain text and cipher matching up like here. Notice the cipher alphabet wraps to A after reaching Z using the cipher system. You could encipher the phrase how stuff works like this. Have a go at it yourself, you can see. Both of these systems, the Polybius square and the Caesar shift, form the basis of many of the ciphers used today. The Brihadishwara temple, Tanjore, Tamil Nadu. This temple was dedicated to Shiva and is the magnum opus of Dravidian art. It was built by King Rajaraja Chola in 1002 AD. In ancient days, Thanjavur, known as the Rice Bowl of Tamil Nadu, was an important city to the ancient Cholas. The British Wara Temple amalgamates the best in tradition of temple building, architecture, sculpture, painting and other allied arts. 
It is composed of many interconnected structures, such as the Nandi Pavilion, a pillared portico, and a large hall. It's Fimana, the roof-like structure that towers above the sanctum, sanctorium, or main shrine, is 66 metres high, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view. Now, if those dates are correct, why are we finding nubs all over here? I'd like to see the engineers that were around then to have built these. However, part of the temple may have been. Now, I'm sure you've seen here that there's quite an array of different nubs. Now, in my ancient stone language, the first part, we've looked all over the world at different nub configurations. So, you know, I can't zoom in too much further, but we can see the same sorts of configurations, i.e. square ones, circular ones. But again, they're too shallow to be lifting buses. Plucks are just far too small. Absolutely no need for them to be there. Unless, of course, they're a language. So today we've been looking at Polybius' square. Now, Polybius was Greek, so we can only go back to Greek times to apply the Polybius' square. And again, I've worked on maybe 150 different squares to try and break this code for you. And I'm hitting my head against a brick wall using the English language. However, if we look at this here, my starting points were, if we were going to make a grid, then it's almost like they were leaving us a nub block marker or a shadow to where we were to start. So I was starting my grids, ladies and gentlemen, from here and coming all the way across and doing that as a block. I've done five by five Polybius squares. Notice that there's another one here, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view. Now, alternatively, they could have started at this block and they could have come backwards across the wall, couldn't they? Now, there's so many of them on here, it stands to reason that we would be looking for specific blocks and they could be specific letters. Now, in speaking to my team, Ziggy Dan pointed out to me that Maybe there is no X that marks any spot, which I'm in agreement with. But maybe it was a temple marker. But it seems a lot of work to go to just to give us the name of the temple, which the people over time have been given names to anyway. It looks more to me like they were embedding a language within here, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view. Now, that's one of the most magnificent pictures that I could find on the internet of this temple. You can get fairly close to it, but not this close. It's took me a long time to do so. Now, let's just have a look here, ladies and gentlemen, at uh, this photo. Now, again, this is a temple in India. My good friend Andrew, Ancient History Criticisms, I have been looking at uh, nubs of India for the last four or five weeks with the team of Ukronia Utopia, Dave, Ziggy Dan, and um, we've found some seriously good examples, so I'm not going to ruin that by showing you every single one, but again, the same here, ladies and gentlemen. Can you see the nubs on the front of this building? Now, they're not just singular to the top up here where a plebeia square might have been applicable, but also down in the foundations. Now, across the world at Baalbek and Jerusalem and so on, we see more of a more of a bevel-edged phenomenon. Now, you can find bevel-edged blocks over here in India, but these nubs look they're exactly the same configuration of some of some of the Peruvian examples, ladies and gentlemen. Now, why? aren't they on all of the blocks? Now, it's a little bit difficult with this, but I think there's a, been a bit of twitching up going on. Now, I tried again to apply one, two, three, four, five, because we're finding a nub there, the same Polybius square to different points of these boxes to see if I could find a code, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view. Now, it's becoming rather difficult because I don't think that the language was meant for our current English alphabet. There must be a different ancient key because I'm getting rambles of letters on the paperwork of different... Well, I've done hundreds of them, ladies and gentlemen. Now, look again on the front of this temple how they've split it up. One, two, three, 
four, five would be the bottom because you've got nubs on the bottom base blocks again. Now, I don't want this to distort too much for you, ladies and gentlemen, but if we go across here, exactly the same phenomenon and they're all across the base layer here. Now, I'm just gonna say this, if we were gonna use this as a lifting boss, this goes all the way back down the temple, that would snap. That's not why they're there. Again, why would you have just him there? Why would you have just him there? Now, the plebeia square that I did for this, ladies and gentlemen, actually came back with, and again, another random set of letters, A, B, D, I, J, M, N, U, Y, Z, and again, not actually meaning anything. So I'm missing a key. Now, I'm working night and day to find you one, at this instance, ladies and gentlemen, I'm still not able to place Polybius' square and sort of re-engineer, re-engineer his theory to find us the language. However, ladies and gentlemen, I have found something that might interest you. You knew I would. So what it is, ladies and gentlemen, in Liverpool, I designed a wall and I noticed this. And being ex-Navy, this is Morse code. Now, my Morse code, I don't know it. I'm going to be honest with you. I was in the Navy a long time, and I don't know Morse code. So I came and had a look for it. And it says, permission to come aboard. So there is, ladies and gentlemen, currently up-to-date languages written on walls. And this specific set is in Liverpool. So it proves that this sort of thing has been used down the years, which makes me even more adamant that the ancient nubs is a language. Could it be some kind of ancient Morse code, ladies and gentlemen? Could it be that they were showing us their roots around the world? We've seen that the nub architecture is on the four corners of the planet. Not in all cases are they a language. We've also proved that there are different sorts of nubs around the world. What a constellation. A constellation is a group of stars that appears to form a pattern or picture like Orion, the great hunter, Leo the lion or Taurus the bull. Constellations are easily recognisable patterns that help people orient themselves using the night sky. There are 88 official constellations. Not necessarily each constellation is a collection of stars that are distributed in space in three dimensions. The stars are all different distances from Earth. The stars in a constellation appear to be the same plane because we are viewing them from very, very far away. Stars vary, gre vary greatly in size, distance from Earth and temperature. Dimmer stars may be smaller, farther away, or cooler than brighter stars. By the same token, the brightest stars are not necessarily the closest. Of the stars in Cygnus, the swan, the faintest star, is the closest, and the brightest star is the furthest away. Most of the constellation names we know came from the ancient Middle Eastern, Greek and Roman cultures. They identified clusters of stars as gods, goddesses, animals and objects of their stories. It is important to understand these were not the only cultures populating the night sky with characters important to their lives. Cultures all over the world and throughout time, Native American, Asian and African have made pictures with those same stars. In some cases, the constellations may have ceremonial or religious significance. In other cases, the groupings help to mark the passage of time between planting and harvesting. There are 48 ancient constellations. They are the brightest grouping of stars, those observed easily by the unaided eye. There actually are 50 ancient constellations. Astronomers divided one of the constellation groups Argo into three parts. Modern constellations like the Peacock, Telescope and Giraffe were identified by later astronomers of the 1500s and 1600s. 1700s also. 
These guys used telescopes and were able to observe the night sky in the southern hemisphere. These scientists connected the dimmer stars between the ancient constellations. There are 38 modern constellations. In 1930, the International Astronomical Union officially listed 88 modern and ancient constellations. One of the ancient constellations was divided into three parts and drew a boundary around each. The boundary edges meet, dividing the imaginary sphere, the celestial sphere, surrounding Earth into 88 pieces. Astronomers consider any star within a constellation boundary to be part of the constellation, even if it's not part of the actual picture. Not all stars, billions of stars, and only a fraction of them make up the shapes of our constellations. These are the stars that are easily seen with the unaided eye. Ancient observers connected these stars into the star pictures. All stars, however, fall within the boundaries of one of the 88 constellation regions. As astronomers studied the night sky with modern telescopes, they were able to discern stars in the dark space around the constellations. Stars that were not part of the original pictures. You can see some of these stars by observing the sky on a dark night. If you look up at the sky with binoculars, you will see even more stars. If you have a telescope, even more. All the stars you see belong to one group of stars. The stars in our own galaxy. The Milky Way. Remind you of anyone, ladies and gentlemen? How are the stars and objects in the sky named and located? Hundreds of the brightest stars, those visible with the unaided eye, were given names in ancient times. These included Elatinin of Draco the Dragon and Vega in Lyra, the Lyre. Many of these stars have multiple names, having been observed by multiple different cultures, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view. Today's stars are named by their coordinates on the celestial sphere. This is an imaginary sphere surrounding the Earth. Earth's north and south poles can be extended in space to this sphere, marking the north and south celestial poles. The poles around which the sphere spins, Polaris, marks the intersection of the extended North Pole and sphere. Earth's equator extended into space intersects the sphere and the celestial equator, dividing it into northern and southern hemispheres. All stars and objects in space, such as constellations, can be mapped relative to the poles and equator of the celestial sphere. Their position north or south of the celestial equator, essentially their latitude, is called the declination. Their position east or west essentially is their longitude, or right of ascension, measured in hours, minutes and seconds on Earth. We measure our longitude east or west from Greenwich, England. Right ascension on the celestial sphere is measured from the intersection of the elliptic planet of Earth's orbit and celestial equator. There are numerous catalogues of stars, each with a different scheme for annotating positions. This means that each star has even more names. One of the most famous catalogues from the 1800s, the Bonn Survey, divides the sky into one point wide bands of declination and numbers to the stars from the west to the east using right ascension. In the Bonn survey, Bonner Dushdom wrong, Vega is BD plus 38, 32, 38. The 3,238 star in the band integrated 10 catalogues to include the positions of over 250,000 stars. Vega is SAO 067174 in this catalogue. The Hubble telescope has allowed astronomers to see even more stars. The Hubble telescope guided star catalogue currently lists the coordinates of over 19 million bright objects, 15 million which are classified as stars. There's a diagram, ladies and gentlemen, of what we've been looking at today. These stars are distant objects. Their distances vary, but they all vary far away. 
excluding our sun, the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, is more than four light years away. As Earth spins on its axis, we as Earth-bound observers spin past the background of distant stars. As Earth spins, the star appears to move across the night sky from east to west. For the same reason that our sun appears to rise in the east and set in the west. Stars close to, th to the celestial poles, the imaginary points where Earth's north and south axes points in space, have a very small circle of spin. So if you find Polaris, Earth's north pole star, you will observe it move very, very little in the night star sky. The farther from Polaris, the wider the circle of the stars trace. Stars that make a full circle around the celestial pole, like those in the Big and Little Dippers in the Northern Hemisphere, are called circumpolar stars. They stay in the night sky and do not set. At the equator, there are no circumpolar stars because the celestial poles are located at the horizon. All stars observed at the equator rise in the east and set in the west. Why do we see different constellations during the year? If observed through the year, the constellations shift gradually to the west. This is caused by Earth's orbit around the sun. In the summer, viewers are looking in different directions in space. At night, they are during the winter. What is a zodiac, ladies and gentlemen? Earth orbits our sun once a year. Viewed from Earth, our sun appears to trace a circular path. This path defines a plane called the plane of elliptic or just the ecliptic. The zodiac is the group or belt of constellations that fall along the plane of the ecliptic. It is through the constellations that our sun appears to pass. While there are 12 astrological constellations of the zodiac, there are 13 astronomical zodiac constellations. Capricornus, Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius and Ophiscus. The annual cycle of the zodiac was used by ancient cultures to determine the time of the year. Now take a look at these closely ladies and gentlemen of the ancient alternative view. We're going to come up against these again shortly. Most of the planets except Pluto have their own orbit that are very close to the ecliptic plane defined by Earth's motion within about eight degrees above or below. If you include all the constellations encompassed by this broadening definition of the ecliptic plane, you have 21 to 24 constellations of the zodiac. Why don't the constellations line up with astrological dates? The astrological signs were identified and connected to the calendar about 2,500 years ago. However, since that time, the timing of Earth's seasons has shifted this is partially due to the fact that Earth wobbles a little like a top, making its axis point in different directions at different times. This is predictable cycle of change over a period of about 23,000 years, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view, because the direction of the Earth's axis of rotation determines at which point in the Earth's orbit the seasons will occur. This wobble would cause particular season, for example, Northern Hemisphere's winters to occur at slightly different places over time. Through time, then, the seasons have shifted with respect to the background of the Zodiac constellations. 5,000 years ago, our sun passed through Taurus during the spring equinox. Today, it is in Pisces at the start of spring. So if you wonder why your horoscope may be off a bit, perhaps by several thousands of years, this shift may be the reason, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view. Now, on looking at the specific star constellations, I noticed that the Peruvian-style stonework, as you can see with the nubs appearing in front of you, appeared very consistent to the star constellations themselves. Now, I wondered whether there could be a possibility that this phenomenon may lead us to finding a connection around the world to the star constellations, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view. We now travel around the world to China, to Yangshan. 
the middle monolith weighing 16.8 thousand tons so they were obviously preserving this for a certain reason now if we have a look at the megalith as above is as below if you look at this and mirror it to the stars they are absolutely identical one two three four five one two three four five with underneath identical to the constellation we are looking at ladies and gentlemen of the ancient alternative view now with the size of the megaliths in china at yangshan these were not meant to be moved not to my knowledge because how would you lift these 16,000 tons hmm. so they were obviously meant to be preserved for a reason ladies and gentlemen of the ancient alternative view now was it for our star alignment let's see if we can find any other examples of this today now when we started looking at Tamil Nadu in India firstly we started recognizing that there was a language on the walls now my friend Chris at the Stone Nub language at Twitter made this comparison and I think you can see that it directly compares to Pisces one of our star constellations ladies and gentlemen of the ancient alternative view now the rest of the language on here must be multi-layered as this only points at one section of the wall I'd like to point out what we looked at on the first stone of language that maybe shadow play comes into play and what we're seeing here is relevant to the moonlight and the night sky if this is a multi-layered language ladies and gentlemen then maybe the Sun in the day brought out one aspect of the language and maybe the moon brought out another because as you can see the direct comparison is strikingly similar from China to India to South America ladies and gentlemen of the ancient alternative view I wonder what your thoughts are on this now a very close friend of the channel Andrew at ancient history criticisms in his recent India production promoted Vlad 98 VT's Trikutum India setup of the well we call them nubs now I'd like to point out that this looks absolutely identical to the Orion's belt even to the point here where it's got absolutely all the stars as well if you can see now this is and has to be a link to what they were looking at in reference to the nubs ladies and gentlemen now Andrew's fantastic at documenting the nubs massive congratulations to him on his recent success with his channel like all of you that don't know him that enjoy the stone nub language if you'd like to learn more about the nubs and their worldwide configurations and what they're all about and I link them to a language this man finds as many as anybody he's part of our research team which I'll get to towards the end of the video but I think yourselves can see that this is pretty much identical ladies and gentlemen and we've seen some examples now all around the world it's too close not to be something in it ladies and gentlemen when looking at specific nub variations it is important to remember that when the mainstream narrative says that these are for lifting that we look at the sizes of the nubs look in comparison to this gentleman's head a nub in specific comparison above him would have had to have been the size of a tree trunk now that either means that the scale of person was different in respect to lifting we need to look at the fact that they didn't lift the larger blocks that are by this gentleman's legs now does this not indicate ladies and gentlemen as we've looked at before more of a language than a lifting block the opposing nubs as well ladies and gentlemen are just not conducive for lifting why would you have two opposing one at the top and one at the bottom two at the top two at the bottom it just doesn't make sense 
So I think once and for all today we can say that the Mancure pyramid nubs were not for lifting. Now that's not to say that some were not ladies and gentlemen of the ancient alternative view because as we've discovered the nubs are a multi-layered language, functional and also have different meanings across the world but the same engineers or teachers must have taught that skill. Now can we find these nubs in the Great Pyramid, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view? Well, ladies and gentlemen, of course there are. Some of the most standardised examples of the nubs that we can find are the circle-topped nubs. You can find examples in Peru that are eerily similar to this one on the Great Pyramid. Now, this must be conducive of similar builders. Maybe they were later, maybe they were earlier. The fact remains though, ladies and gentlemen, that the portcullis chamber within the Great Pyramid does hold a nub. There is one of three images of this portcullis. One is a schematic and the other one shines a light over the top of the nub, which you can see clearly here that these exist within the Great Pyramid. So, were the nub architects, engineers, the builders? There are even ornate nubs seen high here as well, just like you would find in Indian examples also. Just one hidden there. It isn't part of the language and it may be functional, but it's certainly a nub, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view. Another ornate singular nub can be shown next to the header here, ladies and gentlemen of the ancient alternative view. There are many, many examples of the nubs within Egypt. So why are we looking at all of them, Phil? What's actually going on here today? The Keeper of Genesis, Robert Boval and Graham Hancock. Chapter 16, Message in a Bottle. Together with the ancient text and rituals that are linked to them, could the vast monuments of Giza and Acropolis have been designed to transmit a message from one culture to another? A message not across space, but maybe across time. Egyptologists replied to such questions by rolling their eyes and hooting derisively. Indeed, they would not be Egyptologists, or at any rate, they could not long remain within that profession. If they reacted with anything other than scorn and disbelief to suggestions that the necropolis might be more than just a cemetery, that the Great Sphinx might significantly predate the epoch of 2500 BC, and that the pyramids might not just be royal tombs. Hmm. By the same token, no self-respecting Egyptologist would be prepared to consider, even for a moment, the outlandish possibility that some sort of mysterious message might have been encoded into the monuments. So whom should we turn to for advice when confronted by what we suspect may be a message from a civilization so far distant from us in time as to be almost unknowable? The anti-cipher. The only scientists actively working on such problems today are those involved in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. They endlessly sweep the heavens for messages from distant civilizations, and they have therefore naturally had to give some thought to what might happen if they ever did identify such a message. According to Dr. Philip Morrison of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, to begin with, we would know very little about it. If we received it, we would not understand what we were getting. But we need to have an unmistakable signal, full of structure, full of challenge. The best people would try to decode it, and it will be easy to do because those who have constructed it would have made it easy to decode. Otherwise, there would have been no point. This is anti-cryptography. I want to make a message for you, who have never got in touch with any symbols of mine, no coo clue, no key, nevertheless you'll be able to read it. I would have to fill in full of clues and unmistakable clever devices. In his book, Cosmos, Professor Carl Sagan of Cornell University makes such the same point. 
and does so curiously enough with reference to the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic system. He explains that the Egyptian hieroglyphs are in significant part a simple substitution cipher, but not every hieroglyph is a letter or syllable. Some are pictographs. When it came to translation, the mix of letters and pictographs caused some grief for interpreters. In the early 19th century, however, a breakthrough was made by French scholar Champollion, who deciphered the famous Rosetta Stone. A slab of black basalt bearing identical inscriptions in Egyptian hieroglyphs and in Greek. Since Champillion could read the Greek, all he needed was some kind of key to relate specific hieroglyphs to specific Greek words or letters. This key was provided by the constant repetition in the Greek text of the name of Pharaoh Ptolemy V and an equal number of repetitions in the Egyptian text of distinctive oblong enclosure, known as a cartouche, containing a repeated group of hieroglyphs, the sake comments. The cartouches were the key, almost as though the pharaohs of Egypt had circled their own names to make the going easier for Egyptologists 2,000 years in the future. What a joy it must have been for him being the only person to be able to decode and speak to the ancients. I wonder whether they'd hidden another secret language within the hieroglyphs, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go and take a look, the fix. When we look at these, if you look at the lines, which might I add, if we just make this a little bit bigger, ladies and gents, there we go. You can see that this is granite and it's lined. Now. If we just think for one moment the universal nub shape which is inverted in this case is like a half sun and you've got them here see how they're lined apart now obviously these are hieroglyphics but these shapes are very very similar aren't they ladies and gentlemen than the nub shapes that we get now if we single those out and go and have a look at them looking a little bit more like this then you can see that it singles out the nub shapes now if this is more the cipher than the language then we could surmise that hidden within the hieroglyphs is a different language now We've studied all over the world. We know that there's nubs everywhere in the world. It's very difficult to distinguish which were the earliest of our nubs. Was it the Peruvian examples that we see at the Coricantia and all over Sashisei Xuan and Olente and Tambo and so on and so forth. But if we surmise that the Great Pyramid and the earlier hieroglyphs some of the oldest writings as well in the world and maybe the ancient wisdom keepers of today and yesteryear hid a language within the hieroglyphics and it's very odd that they're shaped similarly to our nubs ladies and gentlemen so we've been doing a little bit of digging here at the ancient alternative view to see whether we can come up with any other examples that look like this now, if we have a look at this set of specific hieroglyphs here, ladies and gentlemen, then we can surmise lots of different things. You're almost going to have to imagine a lot of the hieroglyphics taken away. And if we look at some of the configurations, although a little bit tarnished over time, these are perfect what we would call standardized nub shapes and also within a lot of the circular shapes you have little tiny nubs now they're all over the hieroglyphs in Egypt and if we can surmise and we're doing a lot of that today surmising but the ancient wisdom keepers of Egypt did suggest that there was a hidden ancient language within the hieroglyphs and all over these and lots and lots of different representations of the standardized nub shapes and circular nubs that we find all over the world. Now we all know that the Egyptians 
or let's say pre-Egyptians, were very, very clever at monitoring the stars. Now, if these are ciphers rather than the language itself, then maybe we are holding the cipher to the ancient language of the wisdom keepers, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view. Now, if there is um, a cipher for the language hidden within the hieroglyphs in ancient Egypt, and we also surmise that the Nub language around the world may coincide with this, or the other way around, um, we have to look at the fact that the ancient Egyptians or the pre-Egyptians could have been looking at magnetic fields and power. They were obviously well equipped at geomet well, geometry, mathematics. What were they looking for? It looks to me like they were looking for magnetic fields. And if that's the case, and the cipher is within the hieroglyphs, maybe we're waiting for the message to decipher rather than we're trying to find the language out of the nubs it's just another thought process ladies and gentlemen so we have to look outside the box here at the ancient alternative view and that is what we are doing to decipher the nub language and also to see whether it holds the key to ancient pa power I hear you all screaming, how on earth could there have been power when all we used was copper chisels, sticks and stones in our ancient past? Well, here's an image from ancient Egypt. It's within granite. It shows how fine with a small needle that this line work actually is. This is six representations of the Dendera star from the Dendera temple. I've been studying this with Shermanator Osborne and it seems lo along the sides here we have a small addition to the star. Now the reason that I'm showing you this on uh, Nub Language Part 5 is that this into granite, literally the power that would have been required to do this on the finest level I leave open to you ancient alternative view. I surmise that these small stars are a representation of a lost power to us, ladies and gentlemen, in the ancient alternative view. Because I don't think our scientists today could replicate these. Now I hear you all screaming, how on earth would that have been done, ancient alternative view? Well, I don't know, is the question and the answer to that. Um, I surmise that even our finest diamond cutting tipped equipment, even our best water jetting equipment wouldn't be able to do this. So I ask you, if there was no power, if our engines had no way to have power, how is this possible? Let alone the functionality and the capabilities of what the pyramid structures would have been able to do. And we've looked at today, ladies and gentlemen, different examples of the nubs, different examples of technological aspects that would have been used to prove that there was power in our ancient past. We keep hunting for the answers to the nub language. Is it the cipher that the ancients left us within the hieroglyphics of ancient Egypt? Or, ladies and gentlemen, is it a stone nub language that we are yet to decipher? I leave these questions with you, ancient alternative. So the nub language plot thickens, ladies and gentlemen, of the ancient alternative view. We know they're worldwide, and we know they're hidden within the hieroglyphics of Egypt, as said by the ancient wisdom keepers of Egypt. Were they pre-Egyptian? Were these people hiding a secret language within the plateau that we also can see around the world? Ladies and gentlemen, I leave the decision to you to open your minds and work out why these buildings were built so enigmatic. Was there electronic power, electrical power, where a cipher was hidden? I believe that this is true, ladies and gentlemen. And I'd love to hear your opinions. And thank you 
very much indeed for watching the ancient alternative view that's all from us at the moment guys if you enjoyed this video then please feel free to check out the link to the ancient alternative view below who are an up and coming youtube channel set to make a real difference to what these nubs may be their purpose and why they apparently are connected across the world this video was brought to you by the Lost History Channel in association with our friends and a huge shout out to Phil who is currently leading the charge on what these things are. But what do you guys think about this anyway? Comments below and as always, thank you for watching.